Happy New Year. We haven't said that to one another. Can we give God praise for a new year? A new year. We are grateful for this new year of 2024. I love the spirit of a new year. A new year renews our minds and our hearts for new possibilities, new opportunities, new ways of being. It jumpstarts many of us with hopes of leaving the past behind and having a better year than the one that just ended. Someone in here wants a better year than 2023. 2023 brought some challenges and some, some irritations and some frustrations and someone, I know I'm not by myself, wants a better year in this 2024. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I knew I wasn't by myself. On January 1st of 2024, I personally proclaimed that I am expecting more in 2024. Something about when it rhymes, right? More what? Glad you asked. More peace, more joy, more love, more answered prayers, more justice, more power, more provision. I am simply expecting more of what God has in store. And I hope you're with me and that you too are expecting more of what God has in store for us in 2024. As a matter of fact, Let's expect our spirits to soar. Y'all see how I did that? Expect our spirits to soar in 2024. That is the, the point of the sermon. I believe it helps to declare such intention to be open to what God is seeking to do in our lives, both individually and collectively. This is why people make New Year's resolutions. I, I know people break those resolutions, and so people tell us, oh, don't make resolutions. You're just going to break them. But I am always an advocate for striving to do better, for being specific about our goals, having an accountability partner, and, and all for the sake of doing better in the new year than we did last year in whatever areas of life you strive to do better. Always know that a more fulfilling and purposeful life is awaiting you and awaiting us. In addition to individual goals, organizations are setting collective goals for the new year. My workplace, Faith in Place, is in the midst of goal setting and making some radical changes to make life and make our work more impactful in environmental justice, and it is needed in this day and time. And maybe your organization is seeking to do the same. The new year allows us individually and collectively to have a sense of renewal, a sense of doing better, moving forward and striving for more in 2024. Our own church, as Pastor Sarah mentioned, is commencing a strategic planning process. More about that in a moment, but first let's acknowledge that this is the year that we will celebrate our church's 150th anniversary. If you didn't know, now you know that this year, as we come into the fall in September, our church will celebrate 150 years. Some people's wheels are turning, imagining all that we need to do to get ready to celebrate 150 years. This is a big deal. All churches don't make it 150 years. And so thanks be to God that we are still here and still worshiping and still serving and seeking to do better, to do more in 2024. That's a major milestone. And it's running in parallel, if you will, to a very detailed and intentional focus, as you know, on our physical church building. 
Welcome again to our friends from pastors, or for, excuse me, partners for sacred places who have joined us in worship today. As we enter this 150th year, we are embarking upon a strategic planning process that centers on this building, asking questions like, why was it built? And what was the intention of the builders and those who planted the First Baptist Church of Hyde Park? What notable events have happened over the years? And what notable people have served and visited or even baptized here over 150 years? As we mine for special stories, people, and events connected to this church and building, this will allow us to set a new vision and a mission for the building and help us make the best decisions about its repair and its future. In our strategic planning meeting on yesterday, we discussed people that spanned from John D. Rockefeller and William Rainey Harper, the first president of the University of Chicago, to the children of Mayor Daley, we're still trying to figure out which one, and Reverend Jesse Jackson, who graced among so many others the, the preschool that, that was in our church and that was our churches, visits by other mayors and elected officials over the years, the wonderful memories of people like Barbara and Jean Krell to Helen Hurst, I learned yesterday the first woman musician of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra who was a member and a Christian educator in this space to our own Willie Pickens and the Pickens family and the wonderful jazz musicians who have graced this sanctuary including Branford Marcellus and even this past summer the one and only Nikki Giovanni with saxophonist Javon Jackson. To you each and every one of you and your time and space in this space is important to us and hopefully it's meaningful to you that as your life progresses, if it happens to take you on a journey beyond Hyde Park, that you look back over your life and you remember the special times and moments that this church provided in this edifice. We'll be asking you for memories and for your stories, for they bring the bricks and mortar alive and will aid us in making decisions concerning the physical church building. All of that in 2024. And with all of those wonderful events and peoples and stories, there is, somebody say there is, another church building. There is another church building that deserves and needs just as much attention. For followers of Christ, our physical edifice, its past, present, and future is indeed important. The decisions that need to be made warrant the hours that will be invested by a team of at least 12 of us and truly all of us. It's just that important crucial even that we spend the time at this point in our history and yet there is another church building. There is another church building that requires as much attention in order to remain standing. It requires as much intentionality for its well-being and if we put the wellness of the other church building first, I promise you that God will bless the efforts related to the physical church building and we'll all experience more of what God has in store in 2024. And let me be clear, we don't need more in 2024 just for ourselves. We need more in 2024 for a world that is torn and complex where people migrating for safety are pawns in political games. We need more in 2024, not just for ourselves, but for those in our communities that are both perpetrators and victims of violence. For while gun violence is down, robberies are up. And people are lost, 
whether they're using a gun or not, and hopeless and afraid on both sides of the violence. Let me be clear, we don't need more just for ourselves in 2024. We need more in the other church building so that we can rise above and be the light that shines in darkness in a world that always seems to have lost its way. As we deal with the building structure, we can and we should and we will simultaneously build up our spiritual church building. For as Jesus says to his disciples in Mark 8, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Our individual and collective souls need just as much attention, even more than our physical structures. Think about the wear and tear that our building endures year after year, climate after climate, change after change. The wear and tear has taken a toll. Now imagine the wear and tear on our spiritual lives, individually and collectively. Our society needs churches with not only solid physical structures, but solid spiritual structures. Spiritual structures where God resides. Spiritual structures where love reigns and hospitality is radical and supreme. Spiritual structures where justice rolls down like water and righteousness like a never-ending stream. There are many, many churches, and I know our friends from Partners could, could attest to this, who need to update their physical structures. There are even more, some with amazing, beautiful edifices that need to work on their spiritual structures. And that is the call of today's text from this letter from Paul to the Ephesians. Paul or Paul's disciples, it's always fun to, to read what scholars think about the different letters, but either Paul or Paul's disciples are addressing the followers of Christ at Ephesus. Paul, who received the revelation from Jesus that he is an apostle to the Gentiles, is encouraging the Gentiles in today's text that they are indeed part of God's family and God's plan for the world. Writing to the Gentile Christians in Ephesus, he says in, in chapter 2, verse 19, you, listen to this, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God. Paul encourages the Gentiles, teaching them about the inclusivity in the household of God. That while in society they feel tensions between Jews and Gentiles and are surely being challenged on whether they are truly God's children, Paul is building bridges and affirming Gentile believers that they are no longer strangers, no longer aliens, but fellow citizens. Imagine once being a stranger and now being a citizen. Not so hard to imagine in these days in our city where people who recently migrated to our country were bussed and flown to our city. Strangers, you can see them. Put yourself in their place for a moment and imagine that, that feeling of being a stranger and then in this city, of Chicago. Imagine being a stranger in this city. Paul says to the Gentiles at Ephesus, who may have also been accustomed to seeing people who have migrated to their city, he, there's a reason he used this metaphor. It must have related to them. Paul says that alienation that comes from being in a new land with new people, that alienation is over. The strange looks are over, unwelcome stares are over, or maybe they're not over, for people will be people. But realize and know for yourself, Gentiles, that you are now a citizen 
Imagine that good news. Imagine if today that it was announced that all those seeking citizenship are now citizens. We would hear shouts of joy. Well, Paul says to the Gentiles, you're now citizens. You are part of God's family. Well, you should know that unless you are Jewish, you fall into the category of Gentiles. And Paul is encouraging you too today that you too are part of the household of God. Just as he is telling the Gentiles in Ephesus, he's telling the Gentiles in High Park Union Church today that we are the household of God. Catch that vision. In your mind's eye, not a physical structure, but collectively that we are also a spiritual structure, a household for God. Let the profundity of that hit your spirit, that we are collectively as a church body, a spiritual structure, a household for God. I just believe that in 2024, as we intentionally think about, plan for, work on our physical structure, that we need to do just as much or even more to work on our spiritual structure. Paul goes a bit further about the spiritual structure, saying in verse 20, that this household of God is built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure, spiritual structure, is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together, Paul says, spiritually into a dwelling place for God. You know, I don't necessarily advocate being a literalist, but I do advocate trying to catch the vision of the multiple ways stories were told and, and, and messages were taught in the biblical and the sacred text. And if you catch that vision of a dwelling place for God, it will blow your mind. Paul is using the building metaphor To aid the understanding of the case he's making, know that the tensions between Jews and Gentiles is great. I can imagine, Pastor Sarah, that there were days that the apostles in the midst of that would say, it's a lot. Inside joke. Paul was doing the hard work, the prophetic work, the spiritual work that led even to us being Christians today. And the work of reconciliation and healing in our day is not necessarily between Jews and Gentiles in this space, but it is of some many, some of the many other striations of humans created in our country and by our country. The many ways that we divide ourselves, black or white, haves or have not, straight, gay or queer, migrants or citizens who are all in need of assistance for basic resources for living. The demographics have changed. But the need for reconciliation and peace is the same. And the spiritual building, God's dwelling place, needs to be strong and built up to meet the needs of society in our day just as Paul did in his day. In his metaphor, he names the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, those who since the ascension of Jesus have been doing the work of spreading the gospel, addressing the naysayers and the authorities and the rumors and the deniers. Just as we think about those who came before and laid the foundation of this building, Paul acknowledges the apostles and the prophets who laid the foundation of the faith and who continued the work of Christ in hostile environments. Following the crucifixion and the resurrection and ascension of Jesus a couple of decades earlier, then Paul centers in on Jesus. 
in his metaphor of the spiritual building. Listen again to, to the spiritual building metaphor. Paul says, with Christ as the cornerstone, in him the whole structure joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you are also built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. In 2024, as we work on our physical building, it's just as important. No, it's more important that we work on the building of the other church building, the spiritual church building, for it is the dwelling place of God. Catch that vision, catch the vision by catching the metaphor that we come together as a body, yes, for Sunday worship. But the church is more than for Sunday worship. Somebody say amen. amen. The church is the body of Christ. Catch that vision too. And, and now consider this metaphor that we as a congregation are to be built together spiritually. Into a dwelling place for God. Imagine God dwelling within us as a collective congregation. Imagine the wisdom and the power and the ability to bring love and justice and provision to those we encounter. To bring spiritual leadership in the midst of a chaotic world. Imagine all the possibilities for a congregation if we are built up together spiritually and we are a dwelling place. God hangs out among us spiritually. Meditate on that all week if you need to until it hits your spirit. Paul gives us a starting point for striving towards such an awesome spiritual building. He says Christ Jesus himself is the cornerstone. And in him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple, God's dwelling place. More in 2024 for our spiritual church begins with more Jesus. Amen. Looking for the best definition, architect Susan Ford, cornerstone brought me to this. A cornerstone, also known as the foundation stone or the setting stone, is the first stone set in the construction of a masonry foundation. All other stones will be set in reference to this stone. I almost took off running, y'all, when I read. All other stones will be set in reference to the cornerstone, thus determining the position of the entire structure. Paul says for the spiritual building of which we are a part, Jesus must be the cornerstone. And all other stones are set in reference to the first stone. And even as we spend significant time, strategic planning and, and, and future plans for this building, we must take into account that the spiritual building needs to be set with Jesus as the cornerstone. And the first way to do that is to do the work of restoring and refreshing our understanding of the cornerstone. His name is Jesus. For we are a church going through this process. We aren't an office building. We, are, we aren't a, a store or a new apartment complex. We are a church. That means we have another building not made by hands. And so there is this work of setting Jesus as the cornerstone, a solid foundation of the spiritual building, which will determine the position of the entire structure. That, that excites me. Why does it excite me? Because Jesus is a light in darkness. And Jesus is the great emancipator. And Jesus is love. And Jesus is radical hospitality. Jesus is justice. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus is all that and more. And if we can come into the knowledge of who Jesus is, 
and even base our decisions on the physical house, on the foundation and cornerstone of Jesus, then we can be all that God has called us to be. But here's what we need to know as I prepare to close. Jesus is not only the cornerstone of our spiritual house, my friend, help me out with this one. Jesus is the stone that the builders rejected. Psalm 118 was prophetic. It said, the stones that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. You see, the building metaphor in our faith begins in the Old Testament. And as early as the Psalms, the knowledge and prophecy of the faith included the rejection and then elevation of the chief cornerstone. Jesus comes and lives prophetically, naming the reign of God as centered on love and justice, giving spiritual and physical sight to the blind and setting prisoners free. Jesus comes and lives prophetically, making the lame to walk, the blind to see, and providing healing for the have-nots. Jesus comes and advocates for women and children and adulterers who people wanted to stone to death. Because the law said so, but Jesus said, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. Jesus comes and feeds the multitudes and establishes a spirit, not of scarcity, but a spirit of abundance. Jesus comes and flips some tables at the temple where people were being financially exploited in the name of the Lord. Jesus comes and, as Paul said earlier, and abolishes the law and commandments and establishes that the greatest commandment is love and tells us to love our neighbor, love our downtrodden, robbed, and left for dead neighbor, othered by the rest of society and then told they don't belong here, go back home, neighbor. Jesus says that the greatest commandment is to love your fellow humans, especially those ostracized by society. And not just love them, but Jesus said, love them as you love yourself. Jesus comes and ends supremacy of all kinds and establishes love and justice and equity as God's way. For all these reasons and more, Jesus was crucified. For, for these reasons, Jesus was the stone that the builders rejected. And now at the genesis of this statement is the lack of acceptance as the Messiah, Jesus as the Messiah among Judaism in Paul's day and the early days of the faith. But today, included in those who rejected all that Jesus is are Christian and churches who carry the name, but not the mission of being followers of Christ. Their theology and their Christology is not centered on Jesus who flipped the status quo and demonstrated love and justice and abundance, they carried the name. Think hate groups that carried the name. Think, think nationalists who carried the name and then do harm, who totally ignored the mission. They exclude, they've rejected Jesus, but they just use his name and a particular likeness that fits them, and they do harm and hate. They perform for themselves and they do not prioritize the prophetic work of God and the gospel. Yet Paul admonishes us that this Jesus that we know and that we love is the cornerstone of the other church building, our spiritual house, our dwelling place for God, and it must be built with Jesus as the cornerstone. And then all other stones will fall in place accordingly as we enter this monumental year and it will be monumental, High Park Union Church. This year of 2024 will be special and spectacular. We'll have a new baby that's going to be crawling around and crying and singing. And Sarah's going to be trying to figure that out and saying, Noah, what are you doing? <laughs> We've got amazing time to reflect and think and mind on all the amazing things that have happened in this space. There's excitement coming in 2024. We'll have a grand celebration of the 150th anniversary this fall. And as we have this monumental year, let us not neglect the restoration of our spiritual house. Let us not reject the stone, the cornerstone, 
Let us prioritize and get just as excited about restoring and repairing and resourcing than sharing Jesus and all that we're called to be as God's dwelling place. God will send those who need us to be God's dwelling place. God has already sent those into our community who need churches to be dwelling places for God so that they can experience God in their midst. Let us expect more. Let us expect our spirits to soar in 2024. God bless you.